Piyush, um, what part of the success would you attribute to the change of culture? How did the culture evolve? You have five beautiful um, values. How did you pick them up? Uh, was it consulting with strategic partners or uh, advisors? They, they look very dynamic, not the typical ones that you're going to see on every other bank. So I guess, uh, I, I guess there are two questions in there. So the first one is, you know, what has changed in the DBS culture and how has it helped? Um, you know, I, in my first few months when I came to DBS, I sort of diagnosed that there's one part of DBS culture which I like a lot and one part of DBS culture which will definitely need shaking up. The part that I liked a lot was the sense of, uh, I call it collaboration, but it's not a political company. And therefore, unlike most other companies, people are generally willing to work with each other you know, for a common good. So that's good. Um, well, the two things I didn't like. One I didn't like is the downside of this willingness to work together is you often compromise for mediocrity. So it is easy to confuse collaboration with mediocrity because you don't want to surface issues because you all want to be nice to each other. And so you sweep things under the carpet. Right. So that's the downside of collaboration if you don't actually get people to engage uh, in a more honest way about collaboration. Uh, the second thing which I didn't like was we are a very risk averse culture, we're a classic Singapore government uh, machine, right? So kyasu, the fear of taking risks, which means you are process bound and policy bound. And the processes and policies have been crafted to protect the bank, to do the right thing, etc., etc. But the sense of individual accountability and individual enterprise and individual ownership, the willingness to you know, take a risk and do something by yourself, DBS didn't have a lot of that. So in the early couple of years, my big agenda was how do I keep the nice part of DBS but marry it with this sense of individual enterprise. It is okay to take a few risks, it's okay to do things, it's okay to question stuff. And to do that, frankly, I wasn't conscious. We sort of worked our way back into it. But uh, it turned out that using this platform of uh, customer experience and making it central to what we're trying to do, so process mapping and so on, but fundamentally empowering people saying if it's okay and improves the customer um, the experience, it's probably a good thing for you to go ahead and take a risk with. Right? So that was very helpful. Too. So when you ask me what is the biggest uh, outcome we've had from a culture shift, I think we made a substantial shift in the context of making people willing to do stuff. Uh, and that's really dramatically changed our thinking around putting the customer first. So a large part of our policy framework, a large part of what we want to do with the cycle times, turn around, people are willing to do things because um, it helps the customer. And that outcome, you know, we, we rated uh, number one in Singapore now two out of the last three years for the quality of our customer service. We used to be last in Singapore. That change, which is this focus on trying to assure good customer outcomes, that has been a function of this culture shift, right, if you will. The other part of the question you asked is, you know, how do you get to these five pieces of culture? We didn't do that the first couple of years. Right? And we didn't do that because, you know, I was concerned about coming out with a new mnemonic or a new set of words and thrusting them down the organization. Organizations have got to feel real about, you know, what they're all about. So we did that exercise only, um, you know, a couple of years later. And to do that exercise, I figured what would be a good way to do it is to really reach out into the organization and ask people what they felt. So we conducted you know, hundreds of workshops in first in every country with two questions. One is, what do you think really defines the soul of DB? What are we about? What do you think is unique about us relative to other companies? The second is, what do you think we should have that we don't that will allow you allow us to be a better firm? and compete better. And so we got a lot of input from a lot of people. We put that in a bunch of this thing. We used that and created a short list of some ideas that trickled through the organization. Um, we then sat together, you know, 30 people and sifted through all of these and say, you know, what are people telling us? That what is true about us and what needs to be true about us? And so we went through a process of short testing and so on. We came up with, you know, seven or eight big ideas for what People think really uh, uh, personifies us today, 
But people also think, hey, we're not there, but we need to be this if we're going to succeed. Then we went back to the organization. We, you know, used an online tool, uh, a three, four day tool called a values jam. So I, we did a three, four day uh, technology, this thing where we engaged online and we floated all of these again, saying, look, when we sussed them out, these seem to be big ideas. What do people feel about that? And we, you know, got ideas from people, how they related to the word, what they thought was appropriate, why they thought it was important. And we sort of got back together and sussed that out and bring, uh, 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 worked with that. And that's, it's, that's how we finally came up with these five big ideas. To be fair, it was a lot of bottoms up, but it was also a lot of top down. The management team, 20 people plus in that time, we spent, we locked ourselves up in Centrosa for a couple of days to work with this and say, you know, so what does this mean about us? How would it relate to how we compete? How would it relate to the kind of company we are? We had a couple of sessions that, hey, you want to be this. And we say, you know what, this doesn't ring true to the kind of company we are. We'll never be able to own this. So we've got to try and figure things that we can really own, which will resonate with people. So you think about our, the way you define our values now, this thing about being purpose driven. It is the number one thing that came out from the company in both what we should be but also what we probably are. And that was really interesting to me because a lot of purpose. Sense of purpose. Sense of purpose. You know, and it was really, I never thought about it. It came back and I started understanding why it is so important to people in DBS. It's enshrined in our roots. We go back to DBS's formation. DBS was created from EDB to help in the development and growth of Singapore. The people who've been around 40 years, the people who've been this thing, have that sense of mission. That, you know, we were created to help Singapore grow. And so it's not, our job is not to make money. Our job was to create Singapore. Our job was to create something and make something better in this country. When we acquired the Postal Savings Bank in the late 90s, right, we acquired an institution which was 135 years old. It is the you know, institution for the common man in the street. So a lot of people who came from that always had this thing about, you know, our job is to inculcate the savings habit among Singaporeans. That's why we were created. Right? And it became quite clear to me that this whole sense of we are bigger than just, you know, shareholder profit or shareholder value is deeply ingrained in the psyche of our people. So for us, it's a short step to make sure that having a clear understanding of what is our purpose going forward and making sure it's deeply embedded in the company is not as challenging as it is for many other com companies because people feel that's what defines us, that's what you know created us and it's deeply rooted in the company. Interestingly enough, um, we've been studying positive psychology and many researchers uh, in behavioral economy, I'm an economist myself, and one of the latest theories in well-being is by Dr. Martin Seligman, Flourish, and it consists PERMA model, which is positive emotions, engagement, relationship, meaning, and accomplishment. And when you talk about meaning, it's sense of purpose. And, there you go. and when you talk about uh, a relationship is part of a, these are already two two of your values. It's part of the perma thing. The interesting relationship, you know, what came out strongly was actually not relationship. Right? We call it relationship because we wanted to come up with the mnemonic of pride, right? What really comes up, and that's how we use relationship, is really a sense of collaboration. And the sense of collaboration so is really more about how do we work together as a relationship within the firm. It's a sense of family. You know, you in your thing, I remember you said something, what do you think about caring? Our context of relationship is a context of how do you create a thing where you genuinely want to work together because you have a sense of oneness, a sense of family, a sense of working, but we, what we laid on it may be not very good, is you want to do this, but you want to do this in an honest way. You want to do this so you're not sweeping things in the carpet, but you're actually able to have constructive dissent, right? That's part of this, uh, this thing. That's basically how we define the relationship lens. It's an internal collaborative relationship, but an honest relationship. If you would see me talking in a conference last week, uh, I started it and I asked, who has a best friend? Please raise your hand. Everybody raise your hand. And then I say, whose best friend is your boss? And then everybody laughed. And I said, that's really a pity, isn't it? Because we are spending majority of our daylight time at the workplace. And if we could make a sense of family. So what is a fear? The fear is that people will cross your boundaries. But in a family, you are actually a parent, yeah. and you have your red lines and your values. 
So you created the values to safeguard, and one of them is family actually behind the relationship. So that's really so that's our sense of you know when we say relationship, it is being constructively collaboration like a family is. That's the example we use. You know, we work in a family. You know, it, it doesn't mean everything. You fight in the family. You know, your father will tell this is not right, and you educate people at work, but you still work collaboratively as a unit. That's what for us the sense of uh, relationship is. Innovation, which is the third one, uh, that really embodies the sense of change, right? The, the the willingness to be able to drive change, not to accept change, but drive change. You know, question the status quo. And again, like I said, purpose, we start with people thinking, you know, it's not difficult for us. Uh, innovation is not easy for us because that was traditionally not the kind of company we are. In the last two or three years, along with the customer experience, innovation was a large part of, and people have embraced it. So it's like all over the company today. So people felt this is something that's really going to make a difference and that's how we want to be seen as an you know, innovative company. It makes change happen. Right?